Welcome to the 16th episode of Season 4 of the Ubuntu UK Podcast. It's Tuesday the 27th of September 2011, and in this episode we're going to talk to our guest presenter about what he gets up to, and talk about backups. We will of course cover Ooh. the latest news, events, a bit about Ubuntu, command line love, and go over your feedback. I'm Mark. <laughs> nearly nearly <laughs> caught you out there. And with me this week are Tony. Hello Mark. Alan. Hello. Ooh. And ooh, hello. Uh, and our special guest host for this week, Anton Piatek. Hello. Hello. So, Tony. Yes, mate. What have you been up to? Oh, big couple of weeks for me. Um, the main thing is I finally launched my uh, wedding photography website. Plug, plug, plug. Plug, plug, plug. Uh, which you can, so, yeah, Mark, I, I, how, how are you? What are no, you no, 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 I haven't finished yet. <laughs> I imagine um, that's available at tonywetmore.co.uk slash weddings. It is, actually, yes. <laughs> that was a good um, guess. And there'll be URL in the show notes, I am sure. <laughs> no, there won't. Um, but yeah, after a lot of... It's WordPress-based, so it's all good open source stuff. Cool. And uh, I, it's uh, very pretty. And go along and have a look. And if you know anybody who's getting married <laughs> in, in particular, send them that direction. But yeah, it was all good fun, and I like it. Cool. Excellent. Alan? Hello. What have you been doing? I installed uh, Ubuntu on my laptop. On your laptop. Yeah. Is there anything special about that laptop? Well, um, yeah, it's a Mac, so it's EFI. So it's a bit different. Ah. And the reason I did it is because we've got an upcoming release of 11.10. Yeah. And I know there are some tricky things, and I just wanted to make sure all the bugs are filed, and if there's any last-minute glitches, I can get someone to have a look at it. And it turns out there was a glitch, and um, the very lovely Colin Watson, I gave him SSH access to my laptop, and he, SS- <laughs> <laughs> and he SSH'd ah. in at like one o'clock in the morning and um, and fiddled about with it and apparently it's fixed now. So it's good. No, being, no back doors then? No, well, I don't think so. <laughs> it was a, it was just a live CD. I'd booted a live CD and, and downloaded some source code that he wanted to look at and stuff. And yeah, That's cool. That's thought, the, thought good the first time you're doing a show from a computer running Ubuntu in a while, isn't it? <laughs> no, I used my netbook recently as well, which also runs Ubuntu. So, yeah. that, okay. so no. So. Anton, what have you been up to? Uh, mostly reading uh, Modern Perl to try and improve my Perl programming, and uh, actually it's being a bit of a formal education for me. I did a, a joint computing degree with maths at uni, and uh, there's some concepts in the book that were never covered in my degree, so it's, ah. it's quite interesting. It's so. modern and Perl, <laughs> <laughs> and an acronym or contradiction um, in terms, I yes. think. Yeah, the, the book tries to take people away from the Perl that's been around since Perl 1 and talk about the better way to do things now, what the new opportunities mm. are in Perl. Oh, and, right. and basically much more readable, much more maintainable and, and better Perl. That's the thing I always find is it, I pick up somebody else's Perl and I look at it and find it incredibly hard to understand exactly mm. what's going on. And I find myself Googling for weird characters in, <laughs> in, in a sequence and you can never find them. It's... Yeah, but you get some pretty awful C as well. So you can't blame Perl entirely. No, true, true. Yeah. So have you got a project to work on with your improved Perl? Um, well, for my day job, I'm involved in automated testing. So uh, I write lots and lots and lots of Perl. Excellent. Uh, you should talk to Mark about that because Alan and I won't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> More about that later then. Develop okay. a corner over here. Come on then, Mark. What have you been up to? Uh, what have I been up to? I've been using my HP micro server to set up network printing and scanning at home because I've got a, a USB all-in-one Epson thing, which I rescued from a skip about eight years ago. Um Right. In your student days. <laughs> yeah. Um, Spend a lot of time in skip, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's sort of, it's worked fine ever since then. But now I've got a server at home and a laptop and a desktop. It's nice to be able to print and scan from everywhere. So, so been, network scanning, how does that work? Um, basically, you USB plug it into the server and you set up Sane D, which is the Sane daemon for scanning. Um, get it working so that it scans and then you say to Sane share over the network and then you say to anywhere you want to scan from that's my Sane server and then start up Sane it finds it and you say scan so using simple scan just on yeah the... simple scan start up it finds it and I just say scan please and it does it does Sane have clients for any other platforms because I've wanted to do this for quite a long time but currently the printer has been hooked up to my wife's Windows PC instead of the other way around uh, I don't know because I don't have any other platforms at home. Uh, I've not, I've not had the opportunity to look. It's cool though. Mm, oh, well, it is. It's. Uh, I was, I was really excited to sit on my laptop wirelessly in the uh, in the living room and press scan. It came up on the screen, and my and girlfriend then, looked at me and went, "What?" <laughs> Did you not have to get Say, up I'm and leaving. go and walk to the scanner and put the paper I, I in? I put something in already, and then ah, went preemptively and fill your scanner <laughs> with stuff to be scanned. Yes, you? absolutely. Right. Okay. What you need now is something with a sheet feeder, so you can. Feed in multiple sheets without well, your going over the other side. Yeah, I'll get her to stand in there and just <laughs> yell every time I've, I've finished. You haven't trained her to use a computer then? 
<laughs> I'm so glad she doesn't listen to this. <laughs> yeah, you can tell Laura's not here. I think somebody would have got a slap by now. Right, let's get on with the show. Yeah. So we're lucky enough to have Anton with us here, deputising for Laura. Um, but Anton is involved in a couple of projects, um, well, a couple of different things. The first one I want to talk to you about is the South Hackton project. So tell us a little bit about that. So South Hackton has been an attempt to try and create up a hacker space or hack space in Southampton. The London hack space is very well known for being somewhere that uh, people with any interest in anything ranging from computing, electronics, making arts, creation, creating stuff just get together and have a workspace and a bit of a workshop to work in, as well as doing a bit of informal education. Okay, and we talked a little bit about Hackspaces, I think, in the last season, maybe, mm, season yeah. before. Um, and there are there are kind of community-owned space where people can go and use tools that they, and lathes and things that perhaps they don't have access to at home. Yeah, and that's absolutely the goal we're aiming for. Uh, at the moment, we're very small. We've got a regular meetups in uh, the Art House down in Southampton, um, which is a, a you know community-run cafe. But um, we're just trying to drum up the interest and, and get enough people turning up. And we have certain people that turn up a lot, but a lot of them are sort of fairly rare turning up. And it's that gap from having people that turn up for a bit of a chat and play with a little bit of Arduino or a computer to actually going to something where people are turning up very regularly and willing to start putting money towards mm. some sort of community space. I guess that's it. You need people to commit a regular amount every month to pay for the rent of somewhere, I, I suppose. Yeah, uh, and there's lots of options around um, sort of donation funding and grants, community funding, but most of them still you need to have something behind you to say, these are all the things we've done and can continue doing. Starting up seems to be a, a very tricky task. And I suppose as a community effort, it's a little bit like herding cats in that, you know, somebody's just got to sort of stand up and and make something happen, but there's no kind of formal structure around it? Yeah, absolutely. It, it really is quite like herding cats because no one really wants to stand up and do everything, but at the same time, it's more than one person can actually manage on their own. Yeah. So have you got anywhere in particular in mind for, for Southampton? Any um, sites? We've seen a couple of things. There's a couple of um, sort of uh, business centres and um, charity-based um, centres that work with the community and have commercial properties. But at the moment, the biggest challenge is finding something that we can actually move into without having that sort of a very long contract right. and complex terms on, on rent and, and deposits and stuff like that. Because obviously, if you need three months of deposit and a six month contract, you need a lot of money up front to mm. make sure that you mm. aren't going to fail straight away. Have you spoken to the London Hackspace guys to see how they how, how they came overcame that problem? Because I guess they must have had similar issues when they and uh, when they found a place in London, which is obviously very expensive and they had to sign some kind of contract as well yeah we've had some conversations with them we probably need to have a few more um the biggest difficulty is just drumming up the interest and we're trying to work on smaller community schemes and, and sort of a couple of our workshops where we can maybe teach people to build a little bit of electronics uh, an mm. led throwy or something like that um just to get people a bit of interest and, and spread the word mm. so what sort of stuff goes on at the meetings at the moment uh, we've had a couple of little Arduino workshops. The biggest problem is the fact that the people that tend to turn up are all people that have gone, I've had an Arduino, in fact, I've got two, and I've built this, that, and the other, and you go, oh, that's exactly what I've done. <laughs> oh, okay then. <laughs> so you have 100 door entry systems all working nicely, but nothing actually inside. Uh, quite a lot of LED flashing things, and um, right. yeah. Yeah, sounds like the Arduino projects I've seen. <laughs> that's about as far as I got with it. <laughs> My my, my uh, nano is sat on my desk, and when I plug it in, the light flashes. You actually got got it all soldered up, though. Yeah, yeah, I oh, did. Yeah, 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 I did. Yeah. So, uh, is is part of the challenge perhaps um, reaching out to the other groups, like you were saying, perhaps like art and crafts type people, as well as the electronics and the geeks and so on. Yeah, and it's kind of difficult to do when you've only got a couple of hours in, in an evening meetup and yeah. not in a permanent venue because you're limited on what you can do. Um, I think the art house is happy with us bringing soldering irons, but if we wanted to bring welders or <laughs> anything a little more extreme, yeah. I think they'd probably kick us out. Mm. Yeah, the soldering at Og Camp was hurriedly moved outside, I think, <laughs> when somebody thought, oh, maybe we shouldn't be doing this indoors. Um, but So what appealed to you about the, uh, the hack space movement and what made you get involved with this South Hackton idea? Um, I'd spent years trying to teach myself to program PIC microcontrollers and it's actually a bit harder on Linux with the, the basic software than on Windows and I refused to run Windows so <laughs> I struggled um, and then I you know, bought an Arduino and, and found that quite good fun and thought oh this would be great if I could talk to other people and, and help get some understanding of you know 
my electronics is really rubbish. Can you help me understand what I need to do here? Because the internet's full of stuff, but a lot of it makes certain assumptions. Mm. Right. Okay. And are there other people who are who got complementary uh, objectives in the group that you're you're kind of finding you're overlapping with skill sets and things? Or yeah, there's a couple of people turning up that are, are you know incredibly good with electronics. There's one guy that turns up occasionally that um, has built a couple of robots already. So it's trying to get a, enough things together such that we could perhaps have an evening building robots. But okay. building robots takes a little longer than like two hours. So Yeah. And, and how are you able to communicate outside of the two hour meetings? So we've got a um, Google Groups mailing list or, or group. Um, Soha, S-O-H-A dot org UK is our short URL. Uh, we've also got South Acton, but uh, people keep spelling it with two H's and so it gets a bit confusing. <laughs> Um, right. We've got a, a wiki, uh, or a, bl- a wiki there for some ideas, but mostly we've got a, a blog that communicates our upcoming events and, and when we're doing things. So, if you manage to get yourself a, a place, would this be the second one in in the UK, or have there other places? Isn't there one in Manchester. Is I there think. one in Manchester? I think there's Manchester. one in Manchester. Yeah. Ah, right. Okay. So and there aren't that many in the UK in general, and obviously it appeals uh, Mark and I in particular because we live in the, uh, in the Southampton <laughs> area. Yeah. Um, so it will be interesting to see. Uh, if if it kind of takes off and happens, really, I suppose we'll have to start going to meetings. Yeah, I I'm rubbish with the soldering iron and things. That's, that's really but that's the about. thing. The hackspace. The, there was um, I saw an advertisement for the London hackspace where they, um, I think last weekend they did a whole, uh, maybe in one, maybe in two days, but a whole event all about Bitcoin. Hmm. So it was it was nothing electronics. There was no art and crafts there. It was it was it was more like a like a training session and workshop, you know, all about Bitcoin, what is it and yeah, how it affects you and how it can change. And a lot of the, the kinds of people that are into hack spaces and into electronics will be into that kind of stuff as mm. well. Yeah, I know the London one does quite a few courses and, and sort of weekend long workshops and things as well. And is that something that you'd like to see happen in Southampton? Yeah, we, we definitely like to do that sort of thing. Uh, the difficulty is, and we think we've found some possible venues for it now, is is trying to rent a, a room for a day at a weekend that they're happy to let you solder in or, or mm. worse. Ideally, we'd like some sort of venue that would allow us to to you know have welding equipment or something so that if you're building anything a little bit bigger than electronics, you can do it. But of course, that rules out anything with carpet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, yes. Well, good luck. Keep it up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, good luck with that. Yeah, okay, so people, Studio we'll, B? Yeah. Can we weld in there? We can weld all you like in Studio B. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Although Mrs. Pope might not be quite so happy with yes. that arrangement. Um, so the other thing you're involved in is the uh, the use of, of Linux in uh, IBM, who you work for. Yeah. So tell us a bit about this. So um, when I joined IBM, uh, I found fairly quickly that um, Windows was a bit boring and um, started looking around to find out what else could run and found a small community of people running Debian. Um, and then the guy who was mostly running that decided he was going to leave and start a medical degree because he decided computing wasn't for him. And I sort of volunteered mm. to pick that up. And so I found myself running a small Debian fork for you know people in IBM. And then shortly after, we found that there were another two groups in different parts of IBM and around the world <laughs> doing Ubuntu projects and decided that the three of us are all doing the same thing and sort of all merged. Okay. So is this an officially supported Ubuntu version for IBM? So initially it wasn't, but over the last sort of three or four years, uh, there's been a, a big growth. There's always been a, a Red Hat uh, client in IBM. Well, they supply you know, fully supported Red Hat installs with some level of support for all the apps on it. And this sort of got rolled up into the same same group. And so now we have you know, a certain level of support. We've got canonical support for people running Ubuntu. We've got finally convinced some of the internal applications to actually support Ubuntu because a lot of them look at it and go, what's that? We do Red Hat. And yeah. we've sort of said, well, we've got quite a few users running Ubuntu. There's a lot of people outside of IBM running it. You should think about supporting Ubuntu. Makes sense. And just how many people are running Ubuntu in IBM? Well, we've got about 7,000 Ubuntu users running uh, Ubuntu, and that's the ones wow. that are reporting it. There are probably That's the one you know about. More. That's the ones we know about, yeah. Wow. Is that globally? That's globally. Oh, right. And when okay. you say reporting it, is this, you know, with uh, software audit tools or something like that, or is it just um, informally? Something like that. We've got two tools. We've got a homegrown tool that we use across all the Linuxes, and it lets us know that we've got about another 10,000 Red Hat users. Um, it also covers the licensing, so we know how many licenses we've got to buy for support. Mm-hmm. But uh, on the Ubuntu side, I also set up a, a, the popularity contest package ah. so that I report it to two places. So I have fairly detailed data on what packages are being used, which is actually really useful. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah absolutely. Yeah. When I used to work for, I, I did some work for IBM a few years ago, and um, when I first started, the first day they gave me a, uh, a ThinkPad running Windows. And as I walked in, 
one of the other guys said, hey, you want to put Ubuntu on that, don't you? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> and, and so he talked me through and showed me all the repositories and, and, and it was a fully functional desktop with all the tools that I needed to get my job done. And it really didn't matter what the underlying OS was. Everything just, you know, for one of them, it just worked. Yeah, so I've got live CDs sat on my desk that boot up uh, Lucid with the full IBM layer and Lotus Notes and everything on top of it. And you can just run from the live CD if you haven't got it. Your la- you know, well, if your laptop Lotus dies, Notes you- on a live CD. Uh, well, it's a DVD, but yeah, right. um, <laughs> it works actually. You can actually, you, know, you can run the whole stack, but we've got an install. You can get the whole thing installed in about half an hour and trying to do that on Windows, just installing the applications by hand takes you most of the morning mm, and you yeah, want to yeah. you can get a new laptop and half an hour later have every app you need in ibm pretty much so a new starter who comes to ibm who's a bit of a tech enthusiast and maybe likes ubuntu how, how do they find out that, that this exists is it some kind of Secret subversive handshake. underground network <laughs> that you know they discover by knocking in a special way on a door or something um it's not that secret the, the internal search in ibm if you start searching for linux and ubuntu will bring up pages saying run ubuntu on on your work thinkpad Right. Um, we've got a, an IRC channel and forums and, and websites inside that provide loads of information. And these days it seems to be word of mouth that every other person seems to have a Ubuntu CD kicking around and going, oh, did you want to install this? Right. And and as far as uh, management goes, so long, I, I, I guess uh, the, the message that I got, so long as you can get on and do your job, they don't particularly care what what and and so long as the company is licensed for all of the the software that you've got on your machine they don't really care what you have so long as you can get on and do your job is that still the case or? yeah pretty much the biggest um issue you've got to get across is the security issue IOM mm. has a as a large company has a fairly comprehensive set of security rules and they do random audits of your workstations to prove that you are in compliance with them mm-hmm. so for the ubuntu users we've got a little security tool that not only configures what you need such as minimum password length and changes every 90 days and all the things that you grow to hate (laughs) password changes isn't an awful idea um but it not only configures all that but it also then gives you a green icon to say yes you're compliant so the desk side check simply becomes can i see your little icon and they go oh it's green tick thank you brilliant yes that's that's exactly what i had when uh when i when i was using it and yeah so long as you have that green light and your laptop is chained to the desk there's a, yeah. Can't you fine. just make an app that puts the little green icon in the corner? <laughs> Shh. <laughs> Take a screenshot, <laughs> show it when they uh, when they come over. Yeah. So, what are some of the challenges in in packaging the IBM applications for Ubuntu or for other Linux derivatives? The biggest challenge we probably face is just trying to to manage a rollout of your packages. The packaging itself, you've got to learn a bit about packaging. A lot of it is usually we have a, a binary tarball upstream. So you, some of them you can just do you know, really simple make deb sort of stuff that doesn't actually build, it just zips it up. Mm. But the hardest thing is actually trying to roll it out. It's one thing when you go, here, me and my mates, here's a deb, install it. When you've got 7,000 users and you go, I've got a new package, it's your mail client. It should upgrade fine, but if it breaks... You know, what are you yeah. going to do? Fly to all countries and repair all seven thousand machines? That's the challenging part. So, do you have people to support you on site with with this, or is it just a uh, just you kind of extra time and effort as well as the the main part of your job? Um, most of the support is community based, so we have very large community forums um, where a lot of issues get solved. Um, we find the same thing as Canonical did that forums aren't a great way to get bugs raised. So you find a load of issues going on for ages, and then realize there's no bug for this. So how are we supposed to fix it for everyone? Um, but the forums do help a lot. We get a lot of users asking questions of how am I going to be able to do this and getting feedback. We also have uh, three software channels for various levels of, of quality of code. So we have you know, our safe code, we have beta, and then we have an experimental release, which is developers are playing here. Don't enable this unless you want to be joining the developers and playing with stuff that very definitely sooner or later will break something. And do you look at um, productivity apps for the desktop or do you look at perhaps some of IBM's wider range of of products and getting those packaged on Ubuntu as well? Um, So we primarily focus on on the the IBM desktop apps. Um, We've convinced the the Lotus group to start looking at their Symphony and Notes and Same Time suites. And they all now build Debs um, and various levels of support. Most of them are fully supported, I think. Symphony is now in the partner repository, is it? Could be. (laughs) <laughs> it's not something I've actively sought out, to be honest. <laughs> Sorry. Um, for the IBM other apps, most of them tend to be aimed at servers. So uh, we, we tend to steer clear of them because we're aiming at the desktop and, and most of IBM's apps are very much enterprise server. Mm. 
Mm, fair enough. Well, it sounds a bit of a challenging occupation for you, but um, perhaps if any listeners at home have uh, experience of trying to deploy Ubuntu in a, an enterprise environment like that, then they can uh, send us their feedback to podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. It's time for the news. UK political also rans. The Liberal Democrats, who wrote this, have voted to scrap the worst parts of the Digital Economy Act at their conference. Normally, this wouldn't mean much, but as partners in the government coalition, the Dib Dems have a bit more say in Westminster at the moment, just a little bit. Yeah, uh, interesting. Uh, so, which bit do they want? Which bits do they want to scrap? The onerous bits about checking what you do and this is the piracy. Off the net? Yeah, it's those sort of things they were looking at. Um, the the worst excesses, I think they described it as. Which is, you know, good. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Firefox is jettisoning users faster than Internet Explorer at the moment, according to the latest figures from StatsCounter. At the same time, it's pondering moving from its current six-week release cycle to an even snappier five-week cycle. <laughs> oh, wow. that'll do it then. Yeah, really annoy the enterprise customers. Why don't they just do it daily? Yeah. And just, you know, churn out a new release every daily single overnight. day. Daily and crank up that version number to 30 million. Yeah, because that's... That's what make good software. Higher version numbers make yeah. better software. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Microsoft are requiring PCs shipped with Windows 8 to have a security setting enabled, which will stop them from booting into any alternative operating system, pretty much. Boom. Time to join the Open Rights Group. Yeah. So yeah. This is yeah. To do with um, ensuring that all bootloaders have to be signed yes. so that they'll boot. and It's a security other- measure. Yeah. It, it's either a case that every everything else you'd want to run would either have to be signed by Microsoft or the OEM, essentially, which is very unlikely to happen. Yeah. So everybody who makes a computer chooses which effectively chooses which operating systems to allow their computer to run. And of course, everybody's going to choose Windows because if you don't put that in there, then you're never going to sell any computers. But who you know is is every single individual manufacturer going to make sure they've got the, the right keys for every version of every linux distribution in the world no. well some of them may include an off switch uh the chrome uh chromebooks at the moment have a yeah. developer switch so you can turn off the digital signing but obviously there's no guarantee that all manufacturers will put a switch where the software or hardware yeah so gone are the days where a generic pc could run linux Mm. soon and you'll have to really be a lot more careful about the hardware you're buying mm. if this passes if this goes if ahead. the OEMs to agree to it really yeah they will evil enterprise data- database manufacturer Oracle have announced that the popular MySQL database will be enhanced in double air quotes with so- uh, closed source extensions meaning it stops being open source and becomes open core Boo. is anyone even remotely surprised at this I thought that that MySQL was already some sort of not actually completely free. It was dual licensed. Dual licensed, that's what it was. So they could still sell the corporate version version of it. But but based off the same code base, wasn't it? So it was dual licensed, but you get the same code, whichever one you have, but you get support from MySQL AB. Yeah, and if you wanted to buy the proprietary version, embed it and change it and stuff, you could do that as long as you've got the um, The proprietary proprietary version. version. Right, so before you could get a proprietary version of MySQL and an open source version and now you'll be able to get a proprietary version of MySQL and an open source version no no, because you'll be there'll be parts of with the with the old way you either version you got they're the same code yeah but now with a different license yeah with a different license but now it's different code because there's added features that you'll only get if you pay for the proprietary version okay I think I understand now yeah aren't licenses fun (laughs) <laughs> yeah there's been a new release of OpenDisk the project which collates high quality open source software for Windows which now includes LibreOffice and new versions of Firefox and much more yes it's good to see this is still going I remember when it was the Open CD yes. back in the day and yes it was uh, I thought it, it was forked stopped. to OpenDisk yes um, I thought it stopped but it's good to see it's still very active mm. which is really good so if you've got any Windows using friends you can give them copies of Thunderbird and all that sort of stuff and Get them trying the floss. Yes. And that's the end of the news. We've got some upcoming events. Ooh. 
Floss UK Unconference is on Saturday the 8th of October. That's a week and a half away. Yep. Uh, in Manchester Conference Centre, Sackville Street, Manchester. In Manchester the UK. Conference Centre is in Manchester. It is. Okay. No yeah. confusion here. Any ideas what's going on on that one? It's an unconference. Not a clue. So I guess probably they don't know either. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. They've got a website which must be good. It's great. It's got a logo. Well, on hang on, Floss UK, it. isn't that the u- new name for Unix UK, UK user Unix group? user group? Yeah. Yes. Could well be. Yes, I think it is. We haven't done much research on this one, have we? <clears throat> <laughs> the next Ubuntu Happy Hour will be on the 20th of October in the Prince of Wales pub, Rectory Road, Farnborough, UK. Which is falling distance from my house. Excellent. So if you want distance. to come along and buy me a drink or, I don't know, look through the window while I drink, <laughs> <laughs> then, then feel free. What day of the week is the 20th of October? Uh, it's a Thursday, I think. Excellent. So, so the idea is with these happy hours yeah. is, uh, is you come along and it's just an opportunity to meet up and it's not necessarily a geeking out in terms of getting laptops out and you know, all that kind of stuff. It's just, you know, a social evening and it's moving around the country. Next one, I think, will be in Nottingham after this. Don't live very near Nottingham either. I'm sure there'll be one in Southampton. Feel free, feel free to nominate a pub in Southampton. I think I already have, haven't they? Yes. Oh, have you? So I'm waiting for that okay, one. Speak to Alan Bell. He's uh, organising it. Yes, it's, he's paying for all the drinks, if I remember correctly. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. If you'd like to nominate a pub near you, if there isn't already one, there's a map on the... Um, Ubuntu UK slash happy dash hour. There we go. Cool. And finally, in the events section, uh, this is a reminder that FOSDEM is happening. <laughs> When's it happening, Alan? Uh, 4th and 5th of February next year in Brussels, in University Libre Brussels, isn't it? <laughs> University Libre. Libre. I think we have to Have they run out of tickets yet? I think they're... Pr- uh, well, d- you don't have to you buy don't tickets, have to, do you? You just turn up. You just rock up and, yeah. you know, geek out. Uh, yes. So barely four months to sort that one out if so, you're planning yeah. on going. Really think about that. Yeah, really get your thinking head on that. And that's all the events. Now it's time for some command line love. Ooh. <laughs> He's been practicing. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got tonight uh, the XClip command, um, which was Mark's idea, wasn't it? Yes. I, I I was trying to remember exactly why I needed this. Basically, I think I was logged into a server and I had a file open in Vim and I wanted to copy the contents of it and I tried to select it with my mouse, but it wouldn't let me. And so I thought I need a command which will just dump the contents of a file onto my clipboard. And so I Googled a bit and I found XClip. So basically you just run the command, give it the file name, and then you can right-click and paste into hang on, your hang desktop. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. You were SSH'd into a remote server yeah. and you got the contents of something on the remote server into a clipboard that was where? On my desktop. How does that work? Oh, hold on. Maybe I didn't do that. <laughs> Either way, I had a file that I was opening from the command line. I needed it in, in my clipboard. It must have been on a remote server. Otherwise, why wouldn't have I just opened it? Do you it? run the xclip command on the remote server? I must have done. <laughs> Is there some whizzy stuff in SSH that shares the clipboard contents? Well, it does share your X session. So well, if you set the flags, it can share your X session. So it yeah, supposedly so can access some of your X. That could have yeah. been what I did. <laughs> Either way, this command can dump basically the contents of a file onto your clipboard. Yeah. Which is quite handy. And we leave I it found. and we leave it as an exercise for the listeners to work out exactly where they run that command. And yes. under what circumstances it would be useful. I'll I'll yeah, I needed I needed I think I had a query in a file and I needed to paste it into a thing to run a That's right, you've got one and a half minutes left to figure out <laughs> how how on earth this was possible. We when can I- now <laughs> all be well, can all be quiet. There are three of us now to stop talking and leave Mark to explain how the application works the next minute. When I'm next at work I'll look at what I did and I'll add it to the show notes. Thanks. <laughs> I use great. paste bin it to do this. Okay. Although the problem with that, so you just type paste bin it space and then the name of the file, or you run a command and then pipe the output through paste bin it, and it just takes that output and throws it in the Ubuntu paste bin. Now the as downside long as you of don't that, have anything sensitive. Yeah, to is you've <laughs> just made whatever that was public. So if it was a list of phone numbers or passwords or something, you probably don't want to do no. that. Does it have the default settings of expiring after a, a, a day it or something? Doesn't expire. It doesn't expire no. ever. <laughs> so it just stays there. And, you, and if you've done something stupid, you go to the Ubuntu, uh, the canonical sysadmins, and go, "Please, can you delete this paste bin entry because it's got my phone number in it?" Whoops. Yeah. 
Okay, well, if you've done anything stupid with a clipboard, why not let us know? Or if you knew, know why XP <laughs> was actually useful before I work it out again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. Brilliant. So we asked you, the listener, uh, what we should talk about. And this subject has come up a number of times, actually, and we've thought about talking about it for a long time. We've touched on some similar things, I think, uh, in, in the past. Yes. Mm. And it came from Troy Assel, Asley, um, Bugalo on uh, Twitter. <laughs> I think that's how you pronounce his name. G-G-A-L-O. Yes. B-U-G-G-A-L-O. And he says, I'd like to hear what online off-site backup solutions you guys are using with Ubuntu. Well, this is a situation, a, a, a solution very close to my heart at the moment because I managed to lose some stuff at work. Ah, now and it becomes clear why the 10-hour days yes. have been happening. Yeah, I, I wrote some code about two or three months ago, which took me about three weeks to write, so that the work I had to do this week... I'd have all of the groundwork done and unit tested and everything, and I could just get on and do the last little bit. And then I came to do it and found, oh dear, I deleted it by mistake. Oh dear, my backups weren't working. Ooh. Yes. If you're writing code, why are you not using some sort of version control? I deleted the repository. <laughs> okay. So you need a so backup for your version control repository. Yes. So should we talk to Tony first? Okay. Because he clearly doesn't do what Mark does. Yeah, I back up everything. Right, so Tony. Okay. What have you got? And what, how do you back it up? Okay, so my data is probably fairly typical of most people, a few documents, um, a few MP3 files and things like that. But also I have, I'm a photographer, so I have lots of photography files that I need to make sure I back up image files, as we like to call them, in the trade. Um, <laughs> I have most of those on a desktop, but I also have a laptop and a netbook and things. Um, one so you've got multiple computers and multiple you've got computers. files spread over all of them? Yes. Right. And some files are only in, in one place because they take up a lot of space, particularly right. the, the graphic files. Um, I have a, I also have a VPS off-site uh, through Bitfolk, and uh, I also have a DreamHost account, so I have web services that I sit on those that I need to back up as well. My email archive is on one of those uh, servers as well, so I want to make sure that's backed up because as much as I trust the cloud, I don't trust the cloud. Right. Um, so I want a copy of my data where I can get hold of it. So everything's off-site, syncs to a little uh, a tranquil PC server, a little bit like the HP microservers that we talked about in the past on this show. Mm -hmm. um, sits upstairs and, and I use rsync and rsnapshot to, uh, to give okay, me the archive. Okay, so that, that box is just for backing up the remote stuff, yep. the VPSs and the dream hosts. Yeah. And, and they all run Linux. Yeah. Right. And they all back up down here. And I do copy some stuff onto it from my um, laptops and things as well. I also have an encrypted uh, external hard disk that I, uh, I use encrypted using the Ubuntu disk tool, which is really quite neat. Once I realized it was there and it did it, and I didn't have to fit, f um, fiddle around with the command line too much to work out to do it. Well, at all. I tried to do a command line and it didn't work. And then I realized it was a good GUI tool and it did just work. So I have an offsite backup, which is copied onto that hard disk. And every month I just update that and it goes offsite and uh, somewhere a safe distance away from my house should there be a big fire. <laughs> Um, and, and what and what uh, so uh, what tools do you use? You said rsync and rsnapshot. Yes, those are the two main ones. Are they command yeah. line tools? There's no GUI front end or anything. Um, I think there are, um, but I don't use them. Okay, um, particularly not on the server because the servers all run uh, headless anyway. Okay, um, on the desktop, I, I could well uh, sync that or script that. Sorry, um, but I also use Ubuntu One for Ubuntu One <laughs> for. Uh, Keeping some files safe as well, if there's something I want to make sure isn't just on one machine, but is up in the cloud, then I'll stick it in my Ubuntu One folder, and uh, off it goes. Do you have a copy of your Ubuntu One folder? Because I got pointed out that uh, I have some files in Dropbox that, um, mm. while being encrypted, um, are the only place they are. And if Dropbox ever had a fault and lost my files, I'd lose my passwords to everything, which would be a bit unfortunate. Yeah, there's, there's a certain element of that, but the files do actually sit on the disk on the local machine as well as um, up in Ubuntu One. I have had an occasion where for some reason all the files did get deleted, but then I just phoned up Ack and he fixed it for me. <laughs> Excellent. Which Is is that know. phone number available? Or? <laughs> yeah, sure. It's 07... No, no. So the key, uh, key question, how, when was the last time you had to restore something and did it work? 
Uh, oh, that's a very good question. Um, I can't remember, but I did have calls to go through and see if I could find some files, which I couldn't get my hands on through my backups, and I was able to locate other files. Okay. So, yeah, it works. So uh, you're actually using completely free software then, aren't you, for your backups? Yep. Yeah. Good. Of course. Wow. Actually. Okay. Anton, go for it. Tell us what you do. Um, very similar. My my desktop, which also has uh, quite a lot of photos as well as uh, a few other things, um, backs up to uh, a media server in my living room. Um, it's got all my music and, and other stuff on it. And that's raided because I don't trust hard drives. I seem to have one die way too often. So, you know, after three sort of four years, I start thinking about time to replace them. Um, but I worry about the idea of losing my photos in a house fire and don't want to have to run in into a burning building to get them. <laughs> so um, I have a, an old PC sat in my parents' house, which I copy across the internet to. And that's again, rsync. I never used our snapshot. I have a, a script I wrote myself that basically does a, a copy with hard links. And so I've got a copy every month of files. So even if I accidentally delete all my current files, I have a copy from last month and from the month before, and it takes no extra space, but that's the same as our snapshot. Right. Mm. Um, I also do the other way around. My parents back up from their computers onto that server and it copies back to my house. So they have a, a remote copy wow. of everything too. Blimey. Um, that's redundancy several billion times over, I think. <laughs> um, yeah. Please don't my... say your parents live upstairs. Or... <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I just thought that might be a flaw in the plan. <laughs> just checking. I know, I know you're cleverer than that. Do they live, you know, what, what's the blast radius of a nuclear explosion? Do they live further than that away? From um, if there's a, I'm not going to care about that afterwards, to be honest, yeah, if, uh, unless I'm away on holiday on the other side of the world. Yeah. At which commitment? point I'm not worried about my hard disks, I'll be worried about my parents. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, that's true. That's See, he point. is human inside. <laughs> really? <laughs> oh, okay, maybe not. It's the Mark. shiny metal skin that fooled you. Um... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm. As you can probably guess, I'm. I'm not amazing with backups. What I've started. <laughs> <laughs> really? Well, what, what I was. What I was doing at work was simply um, r-syncing my stuff to a server, um, which it turned out wouldn't have helped me anyway because I didn't realise that I deleted my stuff until about a month after I deleted it. Mm. So what I'm doing now is using a tool called Back in Time, which is um, very similar to our snapshot, except it has a nice GUI. Um, so you basically say, I want to back up these folders, exclude this, this, and this, uh, put it here, do it this often, and then you tell it when to delete stuff. And you can tell it, like, it's got a smart delete mode, which will do things like keep one backup from every year, one from every, of like, the um, every six months, and one from every of the past two months, and one from the past, every of the past two weeks, and so on. And So this back in time is a, is a graphical thing. Yeah, well, it's basically, it's a graphical front end for rsync and some scripts that the developer wrote to do a similar job to our snapshot so it runs a daemon in the background that actually does the backup that actually does the backup right. or a cron job or something yep. but then you can just start up the GUI and it will show you all of your snapshots and you can browse through them in the GUI and the the main flaw with it is that it will only do it to what appears to be a local file system so you have to if you want something if you want to do yeah. a remote backup you have to mount it locally um, oh, over SSHFS or NFS yeah. or something like yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, this is the big problem I always have with getting remote backups working nicely is having a remote file system which supports everything it needs to without me having to do a passwordless um, root login to the remote server or to my server or whatever. Yeah, I, which is basically the thing you have to do. And yeah. you can be clever and lock it down, but it's a pain to have to do that. Exactly. Uh, and set up some sort of authentication and make sure it's only running rsync and nothing else. Yeah. And all this sort of thing. Even just rsync can be a bit of a security risk because all someone has to do is craft a command that says rsync and uh, yeah. sync, et cetera, down. And now they have a copy of your password file. And uh, I, I suppose that's one of the things that a lot of kind of domestic scale backup solutions don't have is that hierarchy is that what they call grandfather, father, son or Tower of Hanoi models. And because it's real, look it up. Um, okay. But uh, enterprise sort of, you know, scale backup systems do have that. Um, mm. But you have you need so much more media to store it on. You need you know tapes full of uh, yeah. uh, safes full of tapes and things. Yeah, I mean, our backup system at work is obviously enterprise and my laptop's backed up to it, spends every lunchtime updating the files but I've never tried getting anything back off it because I think I might have to send someone out to go get a tape from a bunker somewhere. <laughs> yeah. What about you, Alan? Uh, so I have a similar mishmash of computers, like desktops and laptops and stuff, and remote servers as well. So my HP microserver is my main backup box, and that's got a bunch of disks in, um, which are raided, 
and I just run our snapshot on there. It's just one one job, our snapshot, and it does over SSH to um, each of the remote servers and does a, a backup every six hours, so four times a day. Uh, keeps the backups for as long as I've got disk space to hold them, which I think I've got four terabytes, and there's so there's plenty of space. Uh, although that disk fights for space with my photos and my videos and stuff like that. Mm. Um, so your photos are just raided and are snapshotted. Uh, the photos are backed up twice and also in a paid Dropbox account. They're on my wife's computer and there she has a paid Dropbox account. And I, I just wanted something super simple for hers so that when she plugs a phone in or a camera or whatever and it drags all the photos off, I don't want her to even think, where are these? Are these backed up? I just want it to be all auto magic and stuff. So it just I have done a symbolic link from the Dropbox folder to her uh, photo folder so that it just, as soon as a photo appears on her computer, it's synchronized up to the cloud. Mm. So, so what do you guys think about the cloud, about relying on, uh, would you ever rely on the cloud as your sole backup solution? Oh, I, I'm doing a backup thing. It goes off somewhere. It says it's done. Well, the, the problem is with something like Dropbox that automatically updates is a quick RM minus RF on your Dropbox folder and suddenly you have nothing in Dropbox and it gets synced everywhere and everywhere that's relying on Dropbox now gets automatically erased too. I've, I've had Yes. That. I've actually done that. I've, actually- I've, I've, I've pointed, I've done it with Dropbox and I've done it with Spider Oak by... I can't remember how I did it with Dropbox, but I did it with Spider by pointing at an empty folder and saying, synchronize that with all my other machines. And what I wanted it to do was bring down all my other machines' files yeah. onto this. And uh, it went, oh, an empty folder. You want me to replace all your files with an <laughs> empty folder? Okay. And it just went, and just got rid of everything in my Spider Oak so synchronized the, folder. That was the thing that worried me with my, my password file in Dropbox. So I added a cron job once a night on my media server to copy my Dropbox into the rest of the folders so it gets backed up. So I now have <laughs> But then a you're copy backing of, up your backup. And it, but it, what I did... It's the object, isn't it? To, to get that back, I had to start one of my machines up that I knew was in sync pull the network cable out and shut down my wireless network so that <laughs> so that it didn't instantly go oh look and then delete all my files so yeah you have to be a bit careful about these things with the cloud because you know catastrophes can happen but it's the same reason that raid is not a backup in that you've still only got one computer yes. with the discs it yeah. protects you against a disc failing but it doesn't not protect you against my own stupidity or your own, or stupidity. Your own or stupidity. stupidity yeah that's yeah. the most common yes. one because i've deleted stuff and oh, gone yeah. oops yeah yeah so really, if you're looking at something like Dropbox or Ubuntu One for a backup solution, you should be copying should be files. It. it should be part of it, but you should be copying files into Ubuntu One that you want to back up so they go off-site or they go around other computers and things, but you shouldn't be using Ubuntu One as the only place to store yeah. live working yeah. Plus documents. There's, there's also the problem that you mentioned, having a hierarchical system. So, for example, you recently wanted to do some analysis of the, log, the Apache logs for our website. Yes. And... Because they'd all been rotated round on the server, yeah, they'd been deleted. Had <laughs> no, no, it's all perfectly normal. The Apache logs have been rotated round as they normally are, mm. and so the oldest ones have been deleted. But because I do a regular backup of that box every six hours, and it's kept like daily, weekly, monthly, I could go back a very long time and find the missing bits. Whereas if Dropbox was just taking a copy of that yeah. folder, that's yeah. gone. So yeah, some kind of hierarchical system would be ideal. Yeah. You ever got you guys ever feel about the need for a hierarchical thing on the desktop? Does it make much sense? It does for servers. Well, but, oh. I'll give you another example. My son uh was plays Minecraft a lot and the the world that he creates is is on the local PC in his home directory and some friends came round and completely trashed his world. And he was kind of distraught that, you know, they'd set fire to his house or something because <laughs> they they weren't experienced players right. and they, they trashed the joint. And so he was quite gutted that he'd lost all this work, in inverted commas, that he'd done. Um, and, and a few days later, or no, actually a few months later, I said to him, actually, I've just realized I can actually get that back. And I went back to, the, uh, to my wife's calendar, figured out the day when those friends came round, <laughs> and then looked on the backup drive for the day before for that folder and pulled it back. And I got his stuff back. You missed a wonderful opportunity to claim to be a wizard there. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, well, well, he was impressed, you know, but he is only five. So. Well, yeah. Um, perhaps if you're listening at home and uh, you have got a backup solution that maybe, you know, 
could help Mark when he deletes his files next time around at work. I'll be all right next time. Yeah, everybody says that. Um, <laughs> Lart tool. Yes, a big stick to hit him over the head with. Um, yeah, so if you've got a solution or some other suggestion for backing up your uh, Linux desktops, why don't you send it in to podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. <laughs> And now it's time for the bit about Gerald Ubuntu. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a bit about Gerald Ubuntu. Yes. Uh, the Ubuntu Community Council is looking for new blood. Yeah, I heard they got rid of some people. <laughs> <They're> looking <laughs> to ditch some time. Yeah. So people who are on the Community Council are on it for two years and then their position expires and we go out and ask new people uh, and also the existing people if they want to stand again. And a few people have said... They are willing to stand again because they their position expires at the beginning of October. And some of us have said we're not going to stand again. Uh, myself and uh, Mike Basinger have also said we're not standing. And so the opportunity is there for other Ubuntu members to take uh, a position on the community council. So what does it involve? Uh, what, being nominated and getting on it or when you're, you're actually on, on it? <laughs> um, uh a lot of it is managing the governance process for other teams. So, for example, managing uh, how elections work for the developer membership board, uh, the IRC council, forums, that kind of stuff. But also there's a bit of work involved in um, managing conflict within the project. So, you know, if something uh, there's a conflict on IRC and it's escalated to the IRC council and it's not dealt with there, then it gets escalated up to the CC. Uh, it's not a huge amount of work. Um, it can be a large amount of work at times like this when there's lots of people expiring and you've got to manage all the voting and all that kind of stuff. But right. it's it's not a tremendous amount of work, but it is quite rewarding. Um, the, the mental picture I've got is that scene in The Phantom Menace where they're all sat around at the top of the tower in their <laughs> round-backed chairs um, and like Yoda and, and Samuel L. Jackson. You've been to Jedi Council. Yeah. Is that, is that what it's like? Yeah, it's exactly like that. Cool. Definitely no uh, phone calls in the garden during podcasts and things like that. <laughs> yeah, we've had a couple of those. Uh, but that, that's also, you know, interesting about um, sometimes it's about managing expectations in the community and and disseminating information that's coming from Canonical and Canonical will consult with the community council in the best way to handle things. So, you know, when, when Canonical are about to make a big announcement, sometimes they'll talk to the community, community council and say, look, how can we approach this? What's the best method for... Um, putting this information out there or how, who should we consult in the community in order to deal with this issue in the right way. So and does, yeah, that, that, does that happen before the last minute change has landed in the district <laughs> <laughs> or is it to be fair, it's getting better. Uh, we did have in the past, a lot of occasions where, you know, Canonical would we say, hey, done look this. At this. how do we, uh, yeah, yeah, look at this great new thing. And the community went, Hey, screw you. So yeah, it's a lot better now. Buttons. Yes. <laughs> Okay, and the uh, Ubuntu One version for Windows has released its second beta, and there's a, a link to the exe file, which is yeah, help, helpfully it's, in our show notes. There's <laughs> a nice shortcut that takes you straight to the exe. Yeah, it's uh, so Ubuntu One when it first came out was only available for uh, for Ubuntu. Yeah, um, and there's a Windows client that's been in under development for about a year, I think. And, and this is a, an official Windows client. Isn't yeah, it's it? the well, API yeah. was always yes, available. it's an official client. Yes. Runs on .NET or Mono or something, doesn't it? It was. They've rewritten it Ooh. in the last few months, and it now uses the same underlying bits as the uh, uh, the Ubuntu oh, right. client. I so, believe it's Python, Python GTK, yeah. and all so that kind of stuff. Presumably, it bundles Python and GTK with the download. Yeah, it's pretty hefty. Yeah, uh, but <laughs> I have some ta- already have all of that on my Windows PC, so Fair it works. Enough. I mean, it's coming for a bit of criticism because it's not the prettiest thing. I think it's all right. It works. It yeah. synchronizes files. It doesn't files. really need to be pretty, does it? No, but it's still got the massive flaw that I keep banging on about, which is the fact that it doesn't work behind proxies. Ah. Uh, which is useless for corporate people. Yeah. Mm. Who does work behind proxies, eh? Yeah. Next up. George, I guess George Castro. Castro, yes. yes. Explains what goes uh, on the new DVD version of Ubuntu 11.10, and it's mostly language packs. <laughs> uh, that's exciting. Uh, no, not anymore. 
Uh, there's extra stuff on on the new DVD. There's more drivers, yes, Ooh. and stuff, <laughs> yeah, which is helpful. Yeah, Nvidia and ATI drivers, extra desktop packages, including XChat, um, the com- a more complete version of LibreOffice, uh, GIMP, of course, which isn't on the CD anymore, oh, yeah. so it's yeah. just on the DVD. Inkscape, Liferia or Liferia, the RSS reader, PTV, the video editor. Yeah, so there's um, loads of loads of extra stuff that because this is a common question. People when they go and Google, you know, download a bunch of ISO and they get dumped at some random folder somewhere on a mirror that's got a DVD image on it, and they think, oh, that must be great, and they download it. And in the past, it it did contain pretty much just the normal install. And like you say, yeah. a bazillion language packs for languages you're never going to use. Um, so uh, they've changed that, and now it's actually got some useful stuff on it. So and presumably, if you're um, making a bootable USB stick, you could use the DVD image instead of the CD image? Yeah, the th- well, the theory was they would have three images, a, a CD size image, a DVD size image, and then one in the middle, right? which is like one and a half gig which would fit on a two gig stick. Ah, I see. That's the theory. This one's too small, this one's too big, this one's just right. <laughs> Yes, Goldilocks. <laughs> There's been an Ubuntu friendly call for, call for help. I don't yeah. know if that's a friendly call for help or... As opposed to the Ubuntu nasty call yes. for help. The unfriendly call for help. Um, so this is to do with the Ubuntu friendly project, which is not a hardware certification scheme. Um, no, but there's, there's a lot of... No, it's an acronym in that somewhere. Isn't. Yes. Um, which, uh, <laughs> but Ara Polito, who I interviewed at UDS, um, has sent a post to the mailing list asking for some help mm. with Ubuntu friendly. So what you have to do, you have to basically run, uh, it's a program called Checkbox, um, which is the testing thing. So, you know. Oh, you say, yes, that worked. I tried, yes. I did that test and it worked. I did yes. that test and it worked. Yes. Exactly. My keyboard works, my mouse works, my video card works. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I can hear a sound. And then when you press a button, it submits that all with details of the the type of machine you've got. So other people who are buying one can look through the list and see how well supported it is. And there's a PPA where you can get a checkbox and uh, apparently there's a bug fix release which fixes a fairly critical bug. Um, so you need to get the latest version and uh, then you'll be able to help submit your data. It's like the super easiest way to contribute to Ubuntu. Yeah. Install this package, run the tests and then at the end you've contributed. Is this, same, is this the same one that's on the desktop and you can run it and test your hardware yep. and you spend ages going, did this color work? Did, <laughs> did this screen resolution work? I got bored the last time I ran that. Uh, yeah, well, uh, it's uh, testing is boring. You gotta, <laughs> I'm afraid. <laughs> Unless you're Dave Morley, in which case it's super interesting. Really? Are you sure it's not? Super interesting. <laughs> right, and lastly, the, uh, there's a new Ubuntu app developer website which has been launched, which looks... Like an Ubuntu website, it's all very cool. Yeah, developer.ubuntu.com. It's, we talked we about, about this before, yeah. uh, did, yeah. with Jonathan Lang, yes. and yes, it's now live. Cool. Yeah, uh, yeah, indeed. So go and check that out. Right, that's all in the bit about Ubuntu for this week. We haven't got much feedback this week, though uh, Neville Ralph says we should just witter on like the Linux outlaws and nobody will notice. <laughs> um, Flame oh, Kebab Neville. sent us a message saying, I was going to send you an oddball voicemail, but my monocle became encased in quiche, dampening my eccentricity field. Sorry, chaps. I don't know what that's about. I have no <laughs> idea what's going on there. I'm hoping it's a reference to the Wing Commander, otherwise he needs help. Did yes. they do that on Linux outlaws too? What, uh, read out random read. weird... <laughs> no, drop monocles in quiche and... I don't know, I don't listen. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Uh, Simon Redmond tweeted the following to us. Do you guys think that forcing people to switch to Unity in 11.10 will mean Ubuntu will lose a lot of users? No. I reckon you just force everyone to switch to KDE instead. Okay, Alan, you said no. Uh, why not? Uh, because we don't have a lot of users in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but as a proportion... <laughs> Uh, no, I don't think so. I think there's a vocal minority that whinge and moan about Unity and how it's rubbish and it's not the same and, oh, it's all changed, it's all different, used to be trees around here, oh, woe, woe is me. Uh, but actually, the vast majority of users that I've seen who use it go, oh, that's pretty. Oh, where's oh, there's the icon for that. Oh, that works. How do I turn it off? Uh, there you go. Job done. It's I, I can't fathom that the vast majority of users out there are going to have a fit when they get to 11.10. I think some will, and some won't. Do you think there's enough going on to help people transition between um, 
the no, old GNOME and the new Unity desktops? Um, no. There's not enough documentation, screenshots, videos. Videos would be stuff. good, yeah. 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 Okay, that would be nice to see. Um, and uh, Amy Ferguson asks that we mention her more on the show. So, well, I just did. Um, so, well done. Hang Hello, on Amy. a minute. And uh, finally... This is Amy who calls this show the Tony and Laura show. Yeah, maybe. Um, clearly, she mm. should come on as a guest presenter. Uh, and finally, rumours of his demise have been greatly exaggerated. It's the Wing Commander. Wing Commander, Sir Arthur Curmudgeon here. Happy to report the rumours of my death have been greatly exaggerated. I'm finally back from my trip to Istanbul on the Orient Express Loco, but I missed my return train. Bit of unpleasantness at border control, I'm afraid. Apparently, some of my fellow passengers wrapped a quantity of baking powder in cling film, along with some dog biscuits, and put it in my luggage. The customs officers with the sniffer dog thought I was smuggling substances from the mysterious Orient. Still, my cousin at the foreign office sorted things out, so I got away from Turkey only to discover when I got back to Blighty that a copy of my passport had already entered the country without me. Some Nigerian general got through passport control pretending to be me. No joined up IT systems at the immigration service, you see. Anyway, I'm going to pour myself a stiff gin and see if I can find my biometric identity card that I paid 35 quid for some years ago. Otherwise, I'm going to have to get new fingers and a fresh pair of eyeballs. Cheerio from me, the WC. He needs his own show. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad he made it safely out of that tunnel, though. Yes. <laughs> I was a bit worried about him for a while. How yeah. odd. Yes. Well, I'm glad he's glad he's safe and sound. Yeah. Um, and as ever, that wraps up our feedback. That's all for this episode, and thank you for listening. You can find out how to get in touch with us on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org, including our voicemail numbers and Twitter feeds, um, and you can leave us messages via Skype and Facebook and IRC channel and all sorts of things like that. We talk about the we have the email address in the show quite a lot, but there's all sorts of ways people can get in touch with us. So whichever way takes your fancy, take advantage of it and uh, send us a message. Let us know what you think of the show or give us your thoughts about Ubuntu and the community around it. Join us again live uh, on Tuesday the 11th of October for our, our next episode. That'll be the last one before Oneric releases, I guess. Ooh. ooh. Does that mean we can stop having to say... No, it's uh, Oneric. It's not ooh. <laughs> Oneric. <laughs> oh, I got stuck at the first syllable. Yes. Does that mean we're going to stop having to say Oneric or Oneric? Yes, we'll just say 1110. Do we know what the next one's called yet? Uh, yeah, 1204. <laughs> <laughs> it's P. It's got to be something penguin. You'd hope so. Ooh. Yeah. Pasty penguin. Perky penguin. <laughs> mm. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Anton, thank you very much indeed for coming along yeah, and being yes. here. Thank you for being stunt, Laura. Yeah. Have you enjoyed yourself? I have. Thank you very much for having me. That's a pleasure. And uh, good luck with the rest of the uh, packaging the world for IBM. <laughs> <laughs> we will be back in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, join us then. Thanks for listening. Bye. 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 Bye.